Welcome back to Season 2 of the Ambition and Grit Podcast with Dave Lineker. Last season, Dave shared his journey in real estate, which began in the early 1970s when he and Gail, his first employee, began building Remax, short for Real Estate Maximums. They introduced a revolutionary business model that emphasized agent autonomy, entrepreneurial spirit, and a novel commission-based compensation structure. This approach attracted driven and talented real estate professionals, and under Dave's leadership, Remax grew into a global real estate powerhouse with thousands of independently owned and operated offices worldwide. But before Dave became the entrepreneur and philanthropist we know today, he was a young man from a small town just trying to find his way. In today's episode, Dave shares his personal backstory and never before revealed details of his life growing up. Let's tune in. I grew up in a small community, farming community called Marion, Indiana. That's a, a county that's about 50 miles north of Indianapolis. A little bit of uh, agriculture, also reasonably close to Detroit. So we had a Fisher body plant, we had a Chrysler plant, we had a glass factory and that type of thing. And so it was a very small town. Dave's father and mother divorced when he was a young boy. His mother remarried a successful small businessman who would later adopt him. But Dave struggled to find himself during those early years. I was the black sheep of the family. Certainly I was older than my siblings. They started coming along when I was probably eight years old or so. So I ended up with a brother and two sisters that were uh, wonderful kids. Huge generational difference between us. They went to school, studied, got straight A's, went to college, graduated, got MBAs. I was at the other end of the spectrum. Certainly was nearer to the bottom of my high school class than the top. I was smart enough, I was not disciplined, and I didn't have any idea what I wanted to do when I grew up. Dave enjoyed a happy childhood with his family. As a young boy in a small town, he decided to join the 4-H club and Boy Scouts. But school was always a struggle. As the smallest kid in the class, he dealt with bullying and struggled to pay attention to his teachers. I was very young. They should have kept me out of school another year. And so for 12 years, I was the youngest person in each grade that I was in. So not only was I immature, but I was also very slight of of height. At my best, I got to about 5'8", and uh, so I was fairly small, wasn't designed for sports or whatever it might be. So the one thing I did do is I worked hard, and so I had all kinds of different part-time jobs from babysitting, of all things, mowing lawns, paper routes, and whatever. And so the ambition was there. I just had no idea where I wanted to go. As a teen, Dave frustrated his parents and teachers with his laissez-faire attitude towards schoolwork. But there were early signs he was destined for entrepreneurship. Let's just say I attended class. Uh, I never once cut a class, and it wasn't my style. But I didn't pay a lot of attention. I wasn't very good at homework. And so, let's just say a C student uh, got a D, my parents were furious, and got a B and they thought that wasn't good enough. I should have gotten an A. And so I just kind of traveled through my school time period. My strengths were realistically, I was destined for sales. I was good at uh, English and literature. I was very good at drama. Those were the kind of things that just went natural to me. I was not good at mathematics. I managed to get through it, but engineering, mathematics, accounting was not my strong suits. After high school, Dave's parents encouraged him to attend college, but they quickly found out that it would not be the right path for him. Unfortunately, mommy and daddy weren't there to make me study at night, and I discovered girls and fraternity parties and keg parties, and I just was not made up to be a student. I was smart enough to be one, but I didn't have the goal, I didn't see the future, and I wasn't disciplined. After three semesters, Dave dropped out of college. He knew that he was undisciplined and needed the chance to become more mature. He had originally applied to the Air Force Academy, but was chosen as a second alternate candidate. 
After realizing college wasn't a good fit, he returned to his original plan. I joined the Air Force, and then I remained in the Air Force probably six and a half or seven years. I made my promotions in rapid time. At the time, I became a Sergeant E-4 in 18 months, which is just unheard of. Of course, it was the Vietnam era and build up and promotions came a lot quicker than they do in peacetime. But the military fit me. I loved the discipline. I enjoyed the uniform. I made friendships that I have to this day. But what it did is it bought me the time to grow up. It bought me the time to mimic successful people. Now, a lot of people's heroes are celebrities or actors or sports figures. Now, mine were not. Mine were fighter pilots. Mine were combat vets. These are real heroes. And when you're on a base with 50,000 of them, you tend to mimic how do they act? What do they do? And so my earliest mentors were military heroes that cared a lot about me and helped me progress through the military. Dave knew he wanted to become wealthy, but realized he would need to carve his own path. So he started looking for additional ways to earn money while still in the military. I was stationed at Davis Monthan Air Force Base. My uh, first assignment in the Air Force when I got out of uh, basic training and uh, Davis Monthan was at Tucson, just turned 19. And I had read a book on how to fix up property and make money. And so I actually uh, only made $99 a month as an E1 enlisted man. And then as the promotions came, it went 400, 500, 700 a month. But back then, remember, a good wage was $4 an hour. In the military, you had barracks and you had your free food and your free medical, and all that. So I worked three part-time jobs in the military to make extra money. And between the part-time jobs and my military pay, I was making almost $500 a month. I managed to find a $10,500 house. I bought it for $500 down. My monthly payments were $99 a month. I fixed it up, sold it six months later for about a $6,000 profit. All of a sudden, I realized I made more money fixing up one property that I put $500 down on than I did working four jobs, and die was cast. In the 1950s and 60s, it wasn't uncommon for young people to marry right out of high school or in college. Like many couples, Dave and his first wife married young and quickly welcomed their first child. I can remember being at the base hospital and looking at this child in this bassinet and thinking, oh my God, I'm a father. I'm still a kid. I had to grow up with my children. And the first part of uh, being married was very difficult on my wife. Number one, I was in the military. And at that time, if we went overseas, we went over for a year at a time. That's tough on anybody's marriage. And then even when I was stateside, I was working so hard at part-time jobs and then at the real estate business that uh, I was away from the home a lot. Dave often says that being in the military not only helped him grow up, but that it also helped him develop grit and determination. When faced with business challenges in the future, he would remember his time in combat. I'm personally proud that I served in the military. I was not unique. <laughs> With the draft and all, the vast majority of the men served in the military in some capacity. And so it's not like we automatically inherited the right to be an American. Some of us had to pay a price. Growing up in the Midwest, Dave was always interested in hot rod cars and the Indianapolis 500. As a boy, he would imagine himself flying planes and traveling to exotic places. He may not have known what he wanted to be when he grew up, but he knew he wanted to experience all life had to offer. I just really started looking at adventure as being my calling. Daydreaming as a child, I wanted to skydive, I wanted to scuba dive, fly an airplane, I wanted to go in the military, I wanted to shoot guns, I wanted to travel all over the world. And so I managed to build a career following my military service, which ended up being in the real estate industry. 
and it gave me the financial resources that I could pursue all those dreams of adventure. The biggest adventure I faced in my life was building Remax, an unknown, unproven concept from one agent to being the largest in the world. Building Remax allowed Dave to create a job he loved and it gave him a vehicle for pursuing all the adventures he dreamed of as a young boy. I have not worked one day in uh, my life since I started Remax. I would pay to have my job. I would pay to come to the office every day. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in the last 10 years, I haven't got a paycheck. If you fall in love with your job, you'll never go to work a single day of your life. But Dave is quick to note that doing what you love isn't without struggle. It requires hard work to build a business. Let's say conceit, swagger, and confidence will take you a long ways. And you often hear in, in the sales industry, fake it till you make it. There's actually some truth to that. And when you're starting in a, in a business that's dominated by old people, nobody knows if a 60-year-old has been in the business 10 years or two weeks. All they know is, hey, this person's 60 years old. If you're selling real estate when you're 20 years old, it's pretty obvious with a crew cut that you're probably still in the military and you must be very inexperienced. You can make it. You just have to work 10 times as hard as everybody else. If you have a mindset, for whatever reason, that you will measure your success in how wealthy you become, you're going to have to find something you're passionate about because the early days of any business is usually going to be a struggle. When people look at Bill Gates, they think it's outrageous how wealthy he is. He worked on computers for 10,000 hours before he made his first cent. And there's this 10,000 hour threshold is about what it takes, which interestingly enough, is basically what an apprenticeship is. The first five years of building Remax were filled with challenges. Debt collectors were calling and his competitors tried to put the company out of business before it even began. But through it all, Dave and his team persevered. The ultimate freedom in life is financial wealth. With financial wealth, you can buy whatever you want to buy. You can buy time. You can hire assistants, associates, fellow workers, so that it's not a one-person company. You can end up with 150,000 people. But wealth gives you the ability to do other things with your life than just your career. And many people accuse me my first 20 years with Remax of being a workaholic. And truthfully, I did work a lot. There were a lot of 18-hour days. I can remember doing a 90-city speaking tour in approximately 120 days. And so there wasn't much time for time off. However, being self-employed with Remax, I could then take a month off and the company continued to run itself. And so I could take the kids in a motor home and a boat, go camping all over the Western part of the United States. And so it's a trade-off. As I matured, I realized just being busy and working all the time doesn't mean you're productive. A lot of times you can work fewer hours and accomplish a lot more if you put time limits on it. And that way you can only work on things that are high importance instead of just killing time at the office. The story of Dave's early years demonstrates that no matter where you start in life, you have the ability to build your dream business if you are willing to work hard and follow your own path. College isn't for everybody. And you really need to think your way through. What do you want to do? Thank God if you know, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a teacher. I know I want to be a veterinarian. Now you're set for life. You've got a goal. You're going to go someplace. But if you're still lost, finding yourself in college is not necessarily a good idea because it costs a lot of money. And sometimes it doesn't hurt you to go to the military for three years or four years. A lot of times you start figuring out you want to be an entrepreneur by the time you're in grade school. I want a paper route, Dad. I've, I've, I've got to make some extra money. I want lemonade stand, Mom. I can make some money on the corner. Some people do it out of financial necessity and the family needs the extra money. But a lot of people are very successful and 
instead of just going to the country club and sitting around the pool all summer long, they're going to get a part-time job for the summer session or whatever. That starts teaching you you are entrepreneurial. Now, it could be waiting tables. That's okay. You can make tips. And you find out the better service you give, the better tips you get. But it starts driving you down this path of, I want to own my own business. I don't want to work for somebody else. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's show. To find more episodes of the show and learn more about Dave and his story of ambition and grit, visit ambitionandgrit.com. And if you loved the show, be sure to hit subscribe and leave a rating and a review wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, remember, everything in life worth having takes a little ambition and grit.